The Holy Gospel according to John chapter 14. Jesus said to his disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. As we continue through the Easter season, we're also continuing to read from John 14, which is a passage we began last Sunday and is from a larger passion of chapters, portion of chapters in John's Gospel, in which Jesus, three days before Easter and just hours before the cross, is gathered with his disciples, his loved ones, who on that Thursday night, albeit not for the first time and not for the last time either, were either by and large completely clueless or in complete denial regarding what was soon going to happen. Jesus knew exactly what was going to soon happen. He was going to die. And there were some things he wanted to say to them in these last hours before then. I think of the times when as a pastor, and there's really more times than I can count, and over the years when I've been able to be present with others in their final hours together. Occasionally, in those situations, there will be someone um, who's kind of in denial about what's going on. And, and, and when that happens, it, it's really kind of an elephant in the room. And it's an elephant that, that means it's really hard for love to say the things that, that love really wants to say while there's still a time for saying. There were really 12 elephants in the room with Jesus. And even being Jesus, he couldn't breach entirely all of their confusion and, and uh, all of their denial, but he did speak the truth. Indeed, in John's telling, he spoke five chapters of truth, which, which last week we heard part of the first part of chapter 14, don't be afraid. It's one of Jesus' favorite things to say. Wonder what's up with that. Don't be afraid, he said. For I'm going away, but I'm not just going away. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. Not because you know where I'm going. You don't need to know where I'm going. You know me. That's all you need to know. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. This reading today picks up from there. John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. In the context of John 14, uh, that actually, Jesus' commandments has an absolute meaning which was just summarized in John 13 when Jesus, earlier that night, washed his disciples' feet, gave himself to them in self-sacrificing love and then said, do you remember, this is a Maundy Thursday text, and then said, I give you a new commandment that you love one another the way that I have loved you. And of course, the way he had loved is by serving, healing, feeding, giving, forgiving them and others too. If you love me, he now says to them, you will keep my commandments. True love for me, in other words, Jesus said, is not just a warm, fuzzy feeling in your heart that makes you feel good and, you know, smile and just have all this faith that you just kind of keep somewhere. True love for me, Jesus says, is love that is seeable. It is evident. It is seen in the way you love, that you treat, that you serve, that you give, that you forgive each other and others too. Lutherans. And I am very glad about this. I was reminded how glad about this I am in a, with a woman I met in the hotel in San Antonio this Friday, but I'll tell you about that another time. Lutherans are known for preaching grace. We have a grace-centered history 
of boldness in saying that we are saved by faith alone, no matter what we've done, no matter what we ever could do. But sometimes we aren't very bold. In fact, we aren't even very good at saying that it might still be important what you do. It's very important what you still do. And no more, my goodness, no. Doing Jesus' kind of love in the world won't save us. We are saved by grace through faith in what Jesus and his love did for us. No, following Jesus' commandments to be his love alive in the world won't get you to heaven. Might point somebody else in that direction. And also, it brings, every time love loves in the world, it does this, it brings some of heaven into the world's direction, which Lord knows this not good at loving world could sure use some more of. Not to mention the fact that if I say I love Jesus to pieces and I just so love what he did, but then not to have any concern about how he might want me to live my life, well, at best, that's just really goofy faith. And worse, it's hypocritical, surely. And maybe worse, it... It, it also weakens faith or can even steal away faith in the way that the things that we do or don't do do have a way of shaping the things that we believe or don't believe. The little boy was riding his trike furiously around the block and around the block and around the block and finally a police officer noticed and she said to him, how come you're, 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 you're riding around the block like you are? He said, I'm running away from home. She said, how come you're staying on the same block? He said, because my mother won't allow me to cross the street. <laughs> As with moms and little boys, so too with Jesus and his little ones. Obedience didn't get you loved by those who love you, but obedience has a way of keeping you close to those who love you. John 14, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides in you. And he will be in you. My dad, who died, my goodness, 34 years ago now, um, my dad, I believe, is, is by the power of love that is real, and by the power of loving memories that are real, my father, in some ways that seriously are real for me, is with me still. He's part of me still. He surely shapes me still. But he died, and, and he, can't, he can't be with me Really, though he's with me in some ways that are very real. Jesus, who died and rose again, promises to be and is able to be with his loved ones alive and truly and always and really through this living reality of the living spirit, whom he calls in John 14 the advocate the spirit of truth. A Bible study note. The word advocate to refer to, to the spirit that's only used by John and only ever used actually in this section of John. The Greek word parakletos, paraclete, literally means one called to come beside. Now in some ways Jesus had been that with them ever since he'd called them one who'd come and come beside them, walking with them in the flesh. He says, I will send you another advocate, another one come to call to come beside you. That word, paraclete, can actually be translated in a lot of ways, advocate or encourager or helper or defender or guide. I just translate it in all of those ways and, and I hear Jesus here who's going to die but rise again promise his followers way more, way more than life-shaping memories of love. He promises his followers a loving and living presence at our side, pleading, encouraging us, helping us, defending us 
with us always and always seeking to guide us in the way of truth, which absolutely in this context has a meaning, right? Jesus had just said, I am the truth. The paraclete, the spirit of Jesus, leads us in the way of truth by leading us in the way of Jesus. Jesus' love for each other, Jesus' love for others. Of course, to the paraclete, the spirit of truth, when we're willing to face it, leads us to true repentance, acknowledging when we're willing to deal with truth that we haven't been. We aren't always. We've claimed to be, but our actions and our inactions have convicted us of not being all that good at being good, all that good at being the love of Jesus alive and living through us in the world. When so convicted, the advocate spirit advocates for us Jesus promising. I'm picturing an, an attorney, a, an advocate, in a courtroom sitting by her client and who not only speaks to the judge on her client's behalf when he's been accused of something, but also leans in. At least, I mean, this is what it so shows on all the law and order reruns I've ever seen. The, the attorney's always leaning in and whispering in the client's ear at key moments. In those key moments when we are the ones convicted by righteousness of our unrighteousness, the advocate spirit never stops whispering counsel into our ears, reminding us anew and again of the truth of Jesus' love for sinners, including the sinners, the far from perfect people who are us, the sinner, the far from perfect person who is you, the sinner, the far from perfect person who is your neighbor. John 14, 18, you have to be the Lord of Easter to keep this promise. Jesus is the Lord of Easter. He promises, I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. I saw a poster recently. It said, if you find yourself struggling with loneliness, you're not alone. It's a little funny. It kind of struck me so. But in Christ... It's true, really. You may feel alone sometimes. I mean, it's none of this, oh my gosh, I'm, I, I'm a Christian. Jesus loves me. My goodness, this is just great. I've never had a bad moment since then. You, you may feel lonely sometimes. You're not ever alone. You may, in grief, sometimes feel orphaned. You may feel bitterly alone, but you're not. You may feel like a motherless child, but you are not not once, for at least since the day you were baptized, yours through the Spirit is always the living, loving presence of your mother, your father in heaven. If you feel lonely, you're not alone. I, uh, I've been in San Antonio all week, which, by the way, I didn't know it was humid in San Antonio. I'd have brought different clothes. This is Texas. I thought it was dry heat. No one told me. So I was doing a little searching on my computer, and I, I'm pretty eccentric about where I end up. I found, um, I was also kind of looking for sermon illustrations, and that's constant. Um, I stumbled across a movie of a, of a 1988 French movie called The Bear, which I will not insult any of you who speak French by attempting to pronounce in French. My daughter says my attempts at Spanish are embarrassing enough. <laughs> it's a story which, early on, there's a mother bear who dies in a rock slide, and there's this little cub who's left to fend for itself in the wilderness, and a little cub fending for itself in the wilderness is a walking meal for predators, and indeed, Immediately, you become aware of this, I don't know if it's a mountain lion or a cougar, kind of, you know, just kind of on the periphery, grocery shopping. Soon, however, the orphan cub encounters this, I mean, magnificent, giant male bear, who, because he's magnificent and giant, has actually been hunted by trophy hunters, because he's a trophy and he's even been wounded, and he's kind of nursing a wound, 
quite unexpectedly, these two develop a bond. And there's kind of this animal kingdom adoption that takes place, and soon this little guy is happily trailing along behind this giant bear who proceeds to show the little guy the things you need to know, how to grub for insects, how to fish, how to, how to scratch your back against a tree. And one day, the little fellow strays, and suddenly he can't find his adopted father, and he's frantic, and he cries out. I mean, the little thing really is crying out, and looking up, he sees the mountain lion or cougar that had been stalking him peripherally all along and had never been able to go for him, of course, when dad was around, but, well, here we go. There's this terrifying chase scene, which leads me to think, I mean, it's really kind of terrifying. It might be PG-13 um, if you want to watch it with children. Um, the little guy runs, and he, and he goes out over this limb, over the, fi- the stream where he'd learned to fish, and the limb breaks, and he falls into the stream, and he's crying, and the relentless predator just keeps coming after him, and finally, the little one is trapped, and he's even bleeding because the, 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 the cougar or mountain lion had actually gotten one swat that drew blood, and that is when this cub, mimicking what he had seen his adopted dad does, rises up, bares his teeth, and roars, except it's not a roar, it's this squeak. (laughs) But then it starts, because there's water rushing, you don't even quite realize, but it starts to sound kind of like a roar. And astonishingly, the mountain lion or cougar uh, lowers its head and runs away, and then the camera pans over, and the little guy turns around, and right behind him, upright and nine feet tall with teeth bared and claws ready to go is Daddy Bear who had not left him and instead now came to fight the fight with and for his little one. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live. And on that day, you will know. By the way, there's a point where we live beyond faith. That's why 1 Corinthians says the greatest thing that there is isn't faith, it's love. Because faith one day will be replaced. There's a day when you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. And with those powerful words, Jesus once again gives his followers something more. They're great things, but he gives them more than loving memories of love past. Even now gives them more of of, of love alive and with us every day along the way. Because I live, he says, you also will live. And some of that's about here and now, but also Jesus is also giving his followers the gift of Easter's promise and Easter's hope of the future and of us, and of my dad, and of those whom you grieve, all in Jesus' hands, and his love holding us, not just now, but all the way to that forever place when the battle is done, and the mountain lions and cougars of sin and death and evil are no more. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. And because I live, you will live. And on that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. And then to verse 21, where we end, where we began. John, this whole five chapters thing gets a little circular at times, but we end where we began. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me are loved by my Father. And I will love them, and I will reveal myself to them. There we are, back where we started. Sinners who are loved, called by God to fight the fight against sin by loving. Gets me thinking back, not to where our text started, but where this chapter started last week, John 14, verse 1. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. In its narrowest context, I always used to think that that verse is primarily Jesus not wanting his followers to be afraid of dying, which it is. Jesus does not want his followers 
to, to be afraid of dying. There's no need, he says. You, I, yeah, I'm here. But in its little broader context, this week it occurred to me there's more than that. Do not be afraid. In its wider context is Jesus saying, don't be afraid of loving. Because he knows that, of course, the thing that most often keeps us from loving is fear. I think of, well, some relationships perhaps that I've seen fear make loving difficult to be able to start. But I was thinking more this week of, of, of political circles and religious circles where these days we hear so much not love. And most of that, though it blusteringly or even theologically tries to sound like tough truth-telling, most of that, I believe, is born of fear. Either actual fear or playing to the fears of others. Fear of change. Fear of others. Fear of the future. Fear of the unknown. Fear of things we do know. Fear of mountain lions and cougars that in sometimes may actually be really out there and actually could do us harm, really. Sisters and brothers, it's not me, it's the Lord of Easter, the one who, when it comes to the most fearful things there are, says to you, been there, done that, rose again, forever, for you. And now he says, through the presence of my spirit, my living spirit, the advocate, the encourager, the helper, the defender, the guide, I am really, actually, with you, always, and that's never going to change. So don't live your life afraid. That's not living. Live your life truly living by living your life truly loving. For love is the kingdom of heaven forever, but to here and now. Amen.